Yesterday, there were several news articles about a feature called Google Duplex. To make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to see some of the articles about the potential of this technology uh, and some of the risks of it with respect to the ethics and you know some reviews about how people have, have found this creepy. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to expand on some of the stuff that CNET said and Marquez Brownlee said. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of three main implications that I believe have an impact for every parent every teacher and every student who's going to be using this technology in the future. Okay, so first off, let's go take a look at the features of this particular um, system inside the video. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. The first thing that you can see from the video is that the Google system actually mimics many of the pauses, the ums, and the ahs that a, a real person would do. And this is really amazing because it makes the person feel like they're they're speaking to a person directly. For example, if you, you heard a robocall, you'd probably just hang up. Whereas if you heard it with these ums and these ahs, you'd be more likely to think that there was a person uh, answering the call. However, that's also pretty creepy, um, and here's why. I mean, essentially, the system is lying to you on purpose to tell you that it's a person behind the, the conversation. It's not identifying itself as a computer versus a person. So in the end, I, I, I think that even if I were on this call, um, and say I, I worked in service, I would have no idea if I was speaking to a machine or if I was speaking to a, a real person. And they were the most popular news source on Twitter during the campaign. And I'll say it again, I'll kind of underline, this is stuff that is false, it is not useful information, it's not helping anybody make a good decision. People are having a hard time telling the the difference between real news and fake news, and computers are, are having this hard time as well. So as a parent, we're having to teach our children about looking at the, the type of content that they see on, say, YouTube Kids, and trying to make sure that that content is appropriate for our children. Well, in the same way, we're going to have to train our own children to learn the difference between an AI speaking to them on the phone versus a real person as well. And so to build that type of skill is not is not going to be easy. And I think it's a skill that is not very prevalent these days. Uh, we're used to talking to people and if it is a robot, like it's pretty, it's pretty obvious it's an AI that we're speaking to. But because those lines are going to be blurred, we're going to have to learn the skill of how to detect between something that is real versus something that is fake. Now, the second implication, uh, I think, is probably just as big, if not bigger, than just the ability to identify. Uh, and that's the actions that the agent takes. So in this case, it's making a phone call on our behalf to a salon, and it's asking the question of, well, I'm, I'm making this appointment. So if it got it wrong, for example, the, the implications are pretty pretty minor. I mean, you'd, you'd miss an appointment. Um, people would be disappointed. Maybe they call you back and they say, hey, you made an appointment for this time. And you might say, eh, no, I didn't. It's like, oh, but the Google Assistant, you know, did it on my behalf. But I think it would be a little bit more serious if you were, say, making an appointment with your lawyer um, or somebody who has, like, billable hours. Like, would you be on the hook 
for paying for the liability of just not being around for meetings that you accidentally booked or maybe you, you you know how we have pocket dialing like what if you had like a pocket appointment so somehow accidentally you know you push the wrong buttons and then suddenly it made some phone calls on your behalf um, you know to to make appointments to certain doctors or certain lawyers uh, and, and these things will all you know kind of have some cost for you so uh, the question is well then are you responsible for the mistakes that the AI makes on your behalf so if they're calling for you and they're putting your name and your number there, um, I think that there's that question of responsibility. So there's a, a second ethical question about, well, who, who takes the blame when it comes to the mistakes that are made in these systems? The third part, which I think is the most risky or the most malicious, is what happens when the same type of technology is used against us. So instead of a, an assistant for our benefit, what happens in the event that it starts being used as a weapon against people? So for example, a weapon of misinformation in a political campaign, somebody calls you up and says, well, you know, I'm, I'm working with such and such campaign, you know, I, I want to get you some more information, um, just to kind of manipulate the way that you think or the way that you feel. Um, and then the second would be also, what if it's somebody who's trying to like telemarket or trying to sell you something? Well, they're calling you up and they're saying, well, you know, I'd, I'd really like you to purchase these things. But then now instead of just saying no, like all the pre-canned responses are, are all built in. Um, I can see it as uh, something that would be potentially very annoying because, I mean, the machine would have no problem calling you at any time of the day. Like for me, uh, as a parent, like I if I received a call like this, or if my child received a call uh, regarding this, I, I wouldn't know for sure, like, is this really for my benefit? You know, if somebody's booking a service, for example, like, they, somebody could create a system that would just book my entire calendar uh, full, like, say, I, I'm a hairdresser. Um, and it would just be from a competitor who was just doing this so that nobody would be booking for me, like, they would all just cancel kind of the last minute. And then, you know, I could keep my, my own lines open. Like I could imagine somebody using it as like a way of like trolling other people or kind of calling competitors to book up their schedules so that, you know, it seems like, you know, their schedule is really full, but in the end, they, they don't make any money. I mean, I, I just see so many potential ways of abusing the system. And this is one of the reasons why I think when it comes to AI technology, because there is so much potential to, to do things on our behalf without us being directly involved or maybe without us explicitly confirming that this is something that we want, I think that we have the concern that anybody could, could use the same type of technology against us or use it in a negative way. Now, you may think, oh, okay, maybe I'm being a little bit too cautious or maybe a little bit, you know, too scared of, of what's going to happen. But I mean, just look at what's happening with some of the news that happened during the election. Just look at some of the videos that we're seeing that are getting through uh, these AI systems. At the end of the day, it's people who are using the same types of systems, they're exploiting them in ways that are for specific purposes, like maybe political purposes or business purposes. Um, but they're used to, you know, uh, to keep people watching, right? Like they, they have, uh, for example, progressively extreme content. Who was co founder of Twitter and now runs Medium. And as said this to the New York Times, he said, the trouble with the internet is that the internet rewards extremes. So say that you're driving down the road and you see a car crash, of course you look, everybody looks at a car crash. The internet interprets that to mean that people want car crashes and to it, so it tries to give us more of them. How that plays out in practice is that they will show you more and more extreme content. And what Zeynep says is, if you're watching a video about vegetarianism, it will start feeding you videos about veganism. If you're watching a video about a conservative politician, it will start showing you white supremacist videos, right? And so the logic of that is not intended to be detrimental to society. It's just intended to like show you stuff that you might want to watch, right? But in practice, the effect that that has is it pulls us into these rabbit holes of more and more and more and more extreme content and makes us I think, feel like that is normal, like it's normal to become worse.
for me, um, as a parent, this is uh, some of the concerns that I have in, in seeing the technology. I do think it will absolutely save people a lot of time. I think it's an incredible technical feat. Like we've gone so far in terms of language, natural language processing, uh, that we're, we're really kind of past the uncanny valley uh, portion where really you can't tell the difference between an AI speaking to you using natural language versus a, a real person. So it's it's an incredible feat. It's it's going to change the way that we interact with a lot of the world, especially when it comes to the the natural user interface. Like it'll be harder to tell the difference uh, between an AI and a person. Um, so it can it can definitely have a lot of benefits, but there can also be a lot of uh, concerns. So I, my goal was to highlight those those three main aspects to expand upon what others had had talked about. Uh, so. I, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, I typically talk about technology from the perspective of parents, teachers, and learners. And so if you'd like to learn a little bit more of that, I would encourage you to subscribe below. If you think that there are other ethical implications for the work that we, we are seeing at Google I.O., um, you know, as a parent, like other things I was encouraged by was just the fact that the Google Assistant can require children to say please. Um, I mean, that was a concern is that maybe the use of these voice assistants is encouraging uh, children to to lose a lot of their manners because they just go, well, hey, Google, just tell me what's tell me the answer. Right. And so, you know, because of that the lack of politeness, you know, that, that type of social skill is disappearing. I mean, that's another implication of this voice uh, technology is that maybe it changes the social norms of how we talk to each other. Because a lot of, uh, instead of trying to be polite and trying to develop a relationship, it's like, who knows? I don't even know if this is a real person that I'm talking to. Maybe I'm, I'm talking to an AI. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I explore. I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, myself as a parent. Um, so I'd encourage you to subscribe. Anyways, uh, thank you guys very much. And I'll see you in the next one.